Right, let's get started with a Hoseworthy recovery um, webinar. Delighted to welcome Ben Stevenson to the call. Um, many of you met Ben back in January in his role for the Institute of Place Management. Um, since then, Ben has taken a leading role in the High Streets Task Force and was heavily involved in developing the Task Force's um, recovery framework. Um, he is operating here as an independent uh, advisor rather than in that task force role, but it's fantastic to have his national expertise online with us tonight. Ben, over to you. Ben, you're on mute. That was a great start. That's the first time this has happened so far. So I'm so sorry. Here we go. Have to reshare my screen. Yeah, I'm just going to uh, uh, remind people as well. Please, during the course of this session, um, obviously we want people to contribute as much as possible. Um, this is not just about Ben talking. It's definitely not just about me talking. Um, we would like people to be polite, respectful, considerate, and where possible, positive. Um, we will have the chat function. Uh, operating as well, which Adrian will be monitoring. If you would like to talk at any point, um, then please, as quick as possible, use the um, raise your hand uh, function and I will try and draw attention to you um, as soon as possible um, at an appropriate moment. Um, if I'm still ignoring you, please just hop back in and ignore me anyway, as I know most of you are fully prepared to do. Um, if I could ask you just for the, the sound quality, I know most of you have already muted yourselves. Um, if you could do that, that'd be fantastic. And let's have some interesting discussions. We're aiming to finish by eight o'clock at the absolute latest. I'd hope we'd be finished before then. But this is all about your opinions, your thoughts. Let's get involved. Ben, over to you now. I can see you're off mute this time. Um, thanks very much for that, Chris. I'm terribly sorry I was on mute. Um, so really kind introduction. Um, Really happy to be here and I hope that we will have some interesting discussion tonight. Um, Chris, I think actually you're going to start anyway, aren't you? You're going to give us a few um, uh, notices about what's going on in Holdsworthy uh, in general. Um, so this is the agenda for tonight. So Chris is going to, um, he's going to kick off with that. Uh, then we're going to do a bit of a recap on the vital and viable work that we did about a year ago. Um, from the IPM, the Institute for Place Management, um, that some of you I know were there. Um, then I want to talk a little bit, and there'll be plenty of opportunity for you to, to pick things around that time. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about what's changed sort of, uh, in terms of the national picture with coronavirus, how things have changed, and then also how places are managing that recovery. So every place is different, every place is unique, but, but there are some lessons to learn from that. And I'm hoping that that will inspire us a little bit to have a conversation about how Holdsworthy might uh, be, be sort of recovering into the future as well. Um, we uh, then, I, we don't actually have that, we, we, did, we did try the poll for a, cu a couple of sessions but it didn't quite, didn't quite t tell us what we needed to know so we probably will not do that tonight. Um, but we'll also talk about the barriers to success, um, the action planning process itself, so you know what, what we're hoping to get out of this and how you can, um, how you can contribute. So, um, Chris, can we just go, we, have, we haven't got a slide for you, have we? But, That's but, fine. Yeah. I think th for me, the crucial thing about this conversation is that a lot of the people on this call have been involved in previous discussions. Have, many people have spoken to, to Ben already. One of the things that fascinates me is actually how do we get more people involved in conversations around Holesworthy? How do we get more people stepping forward and going, right, you know what, I want to be involved in creating change. How do we also get a stronger understanding of what is the change that people want to be seeing? We know that as mentioned a second ago, in Holesworthy, there's only one vacant unit. So to a certain extent, the town center is meeting the needs of many parts of our community but actually whose needs is it not meeting how well is it serving our wider community and i think that's something that i'm really keen to explore where can we grow the impact because if you still walk around the town sort of the square in particular people say to you oh we need more footfall or we need this or we need that 
So what is it that we need to be doing? And this is this session will be contributing towards the development of um, a series of action plans to actually make sure that we're not just talking because it feels like there's been a lot of talk, not enough doing, not enough clarity of what is it that the community of Holsworthy wants to see coming forward. And we're not going to just gather that from people who've already been involved, already spoken to Ben. So I think during the course of uh, this call, I would really value everyone's thoughts on that one as well. Um, we've also, I'm also delighted that uh, Karen Rose has joined us. Uh, it was Karen who ended up um, carrying the baton when we were exploring uh, the Rural Mobility Fund and how we could use um, some funding to develop innovation opportunities within Holsworthy in terms of demand responsive transport and in particular looking at how we support our young people to access the town both for leisure opportunities and for future employment opportunities something that I think is crucial given the rural isolation of much of the wider Holsworthy community. On that note over to you Ben. I'm so sorry Chris I thought you were going to do the sort of the projects that uh... Are you going to talk about the, 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 the sort of projects you've got on the pipeline for Holsworthy? I think I'd, I think let's move on and we'll kind of, um, one of the things that we need to be um, ensuring from tonight is that there's a real clarity of actually what is it that Holsworthy wants to see coming through. Got it. Okay, right. So in that case, let me um, just go through a couple of things. I just wanted to... Um, Tell you a few, a few of the things that I've learned um, in terms of the work that I've been doing over the last few years. I've got a sort of 20 year career in uh, place management um, and uh, working with places to help their economies um, thrive and in this case recover um, from, from, you know, at the moment I'm doing quite a lot of work on coronavirus. And so the, the first that I wanted to just go just, just talk through in terms of these five, five things I know about places that every town is unique. Obviously, you will see that. Um, in a place like Holsworthy, because we know it's unique, you see it all the, you know, you, you just sort of feel it. Um, but it doesn't feel like that for many places. Um, and I just wanted to mention that because sometimes you don't necessarily see that. Uh, it, you don't necessarily see lots of other places and see how they feel. But um, I think we, we talked a little bit before, Chris mentioned before about that idea about Holsworthy's independent spirit. You know there aren't loads of chains in, chains in Holsworthy, and, and in, in many respects, that's really protected it uh, from the sort of ravages of this clone town idea, where you know all places look the same. They've got the same um, uh, tenants. You know, very risk averse landlords that will only ever sign twenty five year leases with a costa, and it's been problematic for a lot of towns that are now really uh, suffering um, as. You know, the experience of that town's meant that people have gone, gone out of town or, or been driven to internet shopping. Um, we've seen a lot of signs in the last few years that places are beginning to make a, a comeback that have got independent uh, shops. Um, and so, as I say, it, it's really good for a place like Colesworthy, but it's not also just about shops. It's about, um, there, it, it's a, we talk about the idea of monoculture in places that have only got retail as a as their sort of place that you know the reason why you would go into town and a lot of places are I uh, sort of identifying themselves in new ways through events and I know you've got fantastic events in town and people's markets you've obviously got a market um in the evening economy in many respects the way that people live in town the way that people work in offices in town is really changing the the identity of the place so every town is unique the second is that change is inevitable and it's necessary. Um, lots of places have lost their way, particularly those, those that sort of identi identify through different uh, particular industries or activities that have sort of fallen away over the years. Um, actually, you've held on to your capital market. I know that a lot of places have lost theirs. Um, and, and, you know, North Devon is, is full of towns that used to have a particular industry that is sort of falling away a little bit. And that means that they, they sort of enter a stage of decline um, and even if it feels like nothing ever changes in Holsworthy there is always change happening all the time and actually you know there there's quite a lot of um, there can be some churn in terms of the shops um, and and but I think what, what 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 it really means is that you know where people are saying that the town is going to survive and you know they'll, they'll, they'll survive through the change 
I think what is necessary is a plan so that change could be a bit managed. Um, and so one of the things that I want to work on tonight is that idea that we can come to a, a bit more of a vision so that everyone's facing the same direction when it comes to changing Holdsworthy for the better. Um, the third is, and it's something that I really want to concentrate when it comes to uh, the action planning process itself, while we can sort of focus on the sort of big infrastructural projects, and I know that there are some in the pipeline and some that a lot of you have talked about, so the viaduct comes to, comes to mind, um, the places that I've seen change and the places that I've seen change most successfully are the places where the community has got, gotten together and done stuff for itself. Um, and I can think of several examples um, in Holsworthy where that's really put it on the map as a place that is seen to come together and, and, and make, a, uh, make a real difference. So we won't, we won't ignore those big infrastructural changes that need to happen. And, and you know, transport is clearly one of them. There are lots of them. But actually, think about what you can do. So when you're coming up with ideas, think about the ideas that, that, that you feel like you can help deliver. Um, and number four, not everyone cares about their town. So I think in many ways, the message for the people that are on this call, you're sort of self-selecting local heroes and champions, and that's great, but don't beat yourself up that you can't necessarily get loads more people involved. It might always feel like things fall on your shoulders, but uh, you know, if that's the case, I'm, I'm really hoping that, that what we can do in developing a vision is, is inspire more people to get involved. So it's not always about um, small numbers of people delivering. Just also remember though, that some, there are lots of reasons why people don't get involved in their place, some economic, some you know, out of time. And it's really important that, that you, know, you don't beat yourselves up about that. And then I guess the other thing is, you know, I say change is inevitable and necessary, but actually lots of places aren't changing we're seeing all sorts of towns up and down the country that are just sort of entering this slow decline where they're really um they're sort of losing retail over time they're not really replacing it with anything else and they don't really have a, a vision so you know it might be it might be an option but it's not a great one if you if you if you do enter a sort of long-term decline then what that will mean is less fewer jobs for your younger people you know they'll move away they'll continue to move away and it will mean less immunity for you as townsfolk. Um, you know, the whole tourist thing, there's lots, lots of, of, of issues. So just going on to the vitality and, and viability work that we did last year, um, there were some really interesting things that came out of that. Um, it was maybe a little bit uh, expansive. Um, I've certainly heard that. Uh, and what I want to do at the moment is really focus on the sort of tangible things that we can achieve in the future. So vitality, uh, all about the life of the place and the viability is about its sort of long-term sustainability, its ability to be able to attract investment um, into the future. And so just looking at the opportunities, this is what the people that, that um, attended that uh, session said. Um, so the idea of connecting it all up, the cycle route to viewed, lots of ideas about cycling actually, which are pretty heartening and I know that they uh, do really well for places all over the place and um, that viaduct idea is is a really interesting one and one that I'm sure we'll get onto tonight um, using what is um, unique to Holsworthy as a, as a way to attract holiday makers is an interesting one a lot of people say that people come into Holsworthy when it's sort of on a rainy day uh, if they're sort of staying imbued and it's a bit like what can you actually use to attract them beyond that um, it's quirkiness, it's, 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 it's status as a, as a historic market town. Um, you know, it's, it's rebranding is a really interesting one. What's its identity? Uh, so something to think about there. Um, the idea of pop-up shops and eating out. Um, it's the rural environment, of course, is, is massive. And also the opportunity for new careers. So they're the opportunities you put. In my first and second impressions, there are a couple of things that I'd just like to add to that before we throw it open to discussion. To discussion. So the first is really interesting to see, um, obviously this Waitrose landed like a sort of spaceship on the, on, on the edge of the centre of town pretty much. Um, it's 
it's less controversial than you'd imagine. It would appear, and correct me if I'm wrong, really open to discussion on this one, but it seems to have been a, been a bit of a welcome driver for footfall in some respects, um, particularly from outlying places. If you go from the villages into Holsworthy Street or Waitrose shopping, then um, some people continue to come into town. What can we do to attract more of those? Um, the market's obviously also particularly important not just for its identity as a place, um, but you know, it, 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 it's, a, it's a historic market town, but it also attracts people in. And as far as I understand, in talking to Kelly, who I understand is on the call today, you know, things have been picking up a little bit, lots more traders. So it'd be really interesting to see whether that has um, improved, has continued to improve over time. Markets are so important, but they need careful curation, they need a consistent offer and they need a, a, a good experience so they need to look good you need tables and chairs and people to sit down the second thing i knew i was going to mention this and presumably it will uh, um it, it, it's always controversial is this reliance on cars now i understand completely that holsworthy is a rural area people come into town um by car and that is just the way that life is but I, I guess I would continue to, to make the point when you look at pictures like this and you imagine what the town square would be like with maybe a few more town uh, uh, tables and chairs and a few less cars, you know, there is a car park right on the edge of the square. It's now, you know, lots of people said well, that people would never use it because it's not free. Well, I understand that's changed a little bit. So there are, you know, a couple of hours free now. And I think the main point I would make about this, and it's the, it's the most important one for people on this call that see themselves as the strategic direction setters for Holsworthy, is when you're listening to in individual traders who say, I want somebody to be able to stop immediately outside, pop in, grab something and go. That is all very well, but there needs to be a balance between those, the individual traders' interests and the economy of the whole town. So when you're thinking about um, that town square, is, is it possibly better that people park a little bit further away and spend a little bit more time going to different places? So it's that idea between a sort of grab and go uh, culture economy and a sort of, you know, dwell economy where there are a few more things to do and, and, and a few more tractors. Um, the other thing just to mention in terms of, of, of this is that I know that we've got the um, conversations about community transport to have. Maybe that could. Uh, reduce the reliance on, car, on the car a little bit. Okay, so I think I'm going to stop there. The questions that I've got on the screen here are, uh, firstly, is this list, is the list still correct? Are we still in a sort of post-COVID landscape? Are those opportunities still the right one for town? The second is, if you think about um, what's lacking in the town, don't always think about, you know, we need a clothes shop. Uh, and I know that People say we need ladies' clothes, we've got gentlemen's outfitters. It's not all about retail. What else is missing in the town? What would really attract people? Holiday makers, other markets, you know, what would attract people to the town? The third thing is, is there anything that you think needs to change in a, in a more general sense uh, for the town to thrive? And the last thing is this case of this, this issue about identity. So you say historic market town, there's a market on once a week. Is that enough to make it really sort of, is that enough to make the identity of the town, you know, to, the, the market central to the identity? Or do you think if you were new to the town, you know, it, the messaging could be something else? So I'm going to throw it over to Chris now, who can manage the sort of discussion. If any of you would like to put your hand up to talk about any of this, particularly these issues about identity, I'd be really interested to hear from you. And also, if I don't know, Adrian, if there's anything in the chat you'd like to mention. So, Chris, over well, to you. As I say, I'm, I'm the only person in the chat so far. Um, I think for me, the final one of those questions is almost. Um, could potentially lead into some interesting places about the first couple of questions. So if you were to step into the, the town centre at the moment as an outsider for the first time, can anyone happily tell me what do you think you would think of straight away? What are those first impressions that the town centre is giving? 
Stephen. Not much colour, rather dull, and um, uh, lacks a bit of investment. Okay, when you say a bit of investment, what do we what do we need to be investing in? Uh, building owners, landlords, etc. Uh, painting up the buildings. Now, if you look at the bazaar, that's been done up recently. It's still in progress, but it's already looking much better than it did before. Um, I think if landlords opted to do pastel colours of different colours for different buildings where possible within regulations and everything, it's a conservation area. I think it would add a lot of brightness and vibrancy to the town. It would it would change the character and give it more positivity i think looking into the square okay i know that um i've in the past tried to persuade some building owners to to do painting in various different towns and it can be a bit of a nightmare uh, i'll be honest because we have a lot of building owners who live away don't actually care about their buildings um but actually i would agree and, and that a newly painted building always looks great um well uh, anyone else agree about the sense of okay go for pete pete you're on mute there we go i always enjoy saying that line oh you're still on you're still on there we go how's that yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. perfect well done yeah i i agree with stephen actually i think the the town does need a lick of paint and um a bit more weeding it's the um, initial thoughts of people coming into the town that look around and think, you know, Holsby looks a bit run down. Now you say about the buildings being owned by people out of town. Well, to be fair, most of the buildings in town are owned by two or three people. Um, Torridge owned a couple as well. Yeah. Um, we have spoken before, Chris, uh, about the powers that Torridge may or may not have to force uh, landlords to paint their buildings 215 uh, oh, well we haven't got powers to force them to paint no. their buildings it's uh, a section 215 is where let me see if i'm i'm sure councillors hutchings and jones will step in if i get this wrong um in fact vanessa probably knows better than i do as well um to where the amenity the public amenity of the building is um impacting negatively mm. sort of on, on the the town center vanessa is that more or less right it must be to us like a fairly high threshold as well. I'm impressed, Chris. Yes, it is. Yeah. Thanks, Vanessa. I'd take that. Just to um, say that you know, I, I, I tend to agree. I don't think it's mostly it's the repair and the paint of the shop. There's some shops that look like they belong in the 1930s. I'm sorry, yeah. but they do. Um, and I don't see necessarily, is there not something we could do collectively to do it? Does it have to be the landlords? Can we do it? Or? Well, I mean, this, that's what I was going to say, kind of actually there are opportunities for us, if we're talking about kind of gathering the community together, um, working with someone on the industrial estate, for example. Um, we know we'd need, you'd need permission from the building owners, but sometimes you just need to start somewhere. It's that first step that's the crucial thing to, to get going um if only we had someone for example who ran a hardware shop or, or something <laughs> like that on the call um uh, th 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 we seem to have um S superwoman heaven kind of reaching in kind of doing a super pose there can't we shame them into it uh, i couldn't say yes well, i'm just thinking the, the place i used to have in town it was a case of oh the scaffolding cost too much that was 15 years ago you know so you think and now the, it's just rotting woods just it's all a good, you know, out of sight, out of mind, but it's not fair on the people around or the people that are actually renting these properties. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's the other thing about kind of other opportunities. Um, could we somehow find a little bit of money, work with um, uh, a scaffolding supplier, if anyone knew one, for example, um, to go, right, well, actually, as a community, here's a special discount offer. You can have this scaffolding for X because we care about our community, which I've no doubt will be fantastic publicity for that um, uh, scaffolding business, saying, look, I really care about my, my town centre. Pete? Um, the town council have got a little bit of money aside for town rejuvenation, but has Torridge got any plans to give us any money towards town rejuvenation? I think, Pete, I'm going to be really honest, um, I, I need to scrap for every penny I can find at, at the moment myself. Um, 
so for example kind of um, all the work that's just taken place in Biddeford came from a government grant um, but the crucial thing is having a vision that what funders and which what Torridge will probably turn around to me and say no is if we're just looking to kind of do piecemeal things oh we'll do a little bit there and then we fancy doing something over here can we give me one second Vanessa um, what we need to do and I can share it really easily is actually develop some kind of a what's called a theory of change so actually what is the the change that we want to be seeing collectively not just the people on this call um, for Holesworthy so in kind of uh, we've just gone through this process and Biddeford one of the things was about kind of well-kept buildings one of the things was about um, seeing more planting not just in the kind of obvious areas but about kind of getting it out and about one of it was about creating improved um, cycling infrastructure to allow people to get in and not have to use a car for example to be able to park their bikes up safely um, so it's a case of how do and I've just actually scribbled it down collectively potentially using Ben's action plan as a great starting point for conversation developing that 10 12 15 points that we all want to be moving towards that some things might be Torridge trying to deliver, some things might be the town council, some things might be trying to persuade people within the community to come forward and deliver. I think when we've got that in place, then we can definitely start attracting funding. Vanessa, please stop me talking. Sorry, now a couple of things. Um, I was gonna mention about Sarah Chapel, we probably need to get her on board as yep. a conservation, because it's a conservation, that's the only thing. But I know she's been really helpful to Matthew New on the designs he did in his building. Yeah. But the only other thing is, some of you may remember John Wright um, about, uh, in 2003 we had foot and mouth. We had um, Toy Chelp Fund with the money we got from there, foot and mouth. And Pam will remember as well actually, a town study which looked at things like the town square, part of it is part pedestrianisation, but looked at the town in general about the entrance points. And that. I mean, I have got one copy of it um it was quite a good document actually so perhaps we could revisit that perhaps that that's the and first time i've ever it, heard about Vanessa, this if i can yeah i've uh, not heard about this one either yeah yeah i'd love i'd love to see it if i can it would really help understand you know what, what was said before i've only got a paper copy i've not got it on because it's 2003 i haven't even got it on disc or anything like that. i've got scan. i can yeah. for this, so I, I, scan it and send it to me yeah we'll do wonderful Thanks. thank you pete thank you for waving your arm around that's, oh, thank you. I just want to go back to the um, first looks of the town and um, I think weeding is another big issue and I know the Torridge guy, um, Pete, he's done a great job but he's reduced his hours down now to half a day and it's just a, not enough time to do all the work that needs to be done in the town square. Is there any chance we can have someone from Torridge to do full time or two guys doing half two half days to help make the town look nice. I think if the town, obviously if the town looks nicer, people are more inclined to come into town. If they're coming to town, they're more inclined to spend money. Yeah, Pete, so one of the things um, that's taking off in Biddeford is a sense of community gardening, where um, actually finding what people have been calling neglected pockets and going, well, actually, how do we sort of work with Torridge to convert what might be an underutilized or neglected space and turn that into something that is positive. Um, now, part of the rationale for that is about finding ways for people to be proud of their town, to feel engaged and to feel like that they've actually contributed. Um, so one of the projects led to a group of brownies park, uh, sort of planting up the back of a car park. Um, well, what happened then was all of those brownies then came back with their parents to see the area they planted up, which naturally brings a load of people into the town and if you've come to see where you've planted you're then going to go and wander around different parts of the town as well those brownies also are really proud of what they've done and they feel like they're, they're part of their town so um nigel yep. sorry councillor Keneally. um thing is though you're paying pete less money now aren't you i you know what i have no idea well, yeah, you're paying him less money because he's doing less hours. 
So I think as a town, we'd appreciate having Torridge perhaps pay someone to make up those hours. And also, can I, can I just add, it's, it's all very well getting the brownies and scouts and all that to do um, a one-off big thing, but it's, it's, a, it's a constant thing. It needs to be it's, kept on top Pete, of. It's, it's not a one-off at all. Um, so this is where we've built up a um, community group to actually keep coming back to it. Um, so we've got charities involved, we've got local residents involved to make sure that actually people are proud of their town. Yeah, um, the, the TDC cleans that every day. No, and, um, no not at all. The TDC guy is. Yeah, okay, but like in terms of this, um, this sort of gardening project, that's a community project that comes in kind of uh, normally on a weekly basis. So, but yeah, I mean, I can ask, I have no in involvement with uh, the street cleansing or with kind of uh, Pete no. kind of and his hours being cut, but I can ask yeah. the questions. Yeah, it, it seems like a very simple thing, you know, uh, to, to ask for, to have someone just do a little bit more in the town. I mean, we can all play our part. I try and keep my shop front very clear, um, but it's the, it's the little bits that, you know, the, the little side streets and all that, that really make holes of E look a bit down and out really yeah that's my biggest crime okay i'll add it to my list thank you a pleasure i can ask i i, I can't promise anything but i can ask a question be a pain as usual good uh, john i think you've got your hand up yeah i'm just gonna um just gonna say like um we talked about the, the weeding or that kind of so i think what you have to be aware of is who owns what and it's not quite straightforward as saying Torres district council do this because a lot of it isn't theirs you know highways is highways um, I know the town council looked at doing some some weeding, and they have to get permission where they can do it and where they can and can't go. Um, so I think it's it's a much bigger picture than just saying, "Pay this guy some extra hours to do it, or get somebody else." And, and I agree with the, with the self help thing. Um, there are people out there at the moment doing bits and pieces around the town off their own backs. Um, you know, I know people that have planted up plant pots and things that you know they just walk past and decide they're going to do it they've cleaned off signs and things um because they just wanted to do it so more of a more of a town approach to these things would be much better much more beneficial at the end of the day Torrance is going to have less money devon county is going to have less money so trying to get them to get to get more money out of them is going to be extra extra hard so i think we've got to work as a town and as a community like you said about the brownies great idea there's a lot of people in the town i think that that will help out with this kind of thing that's probably the, the best way to start doing these to, to smarten up the town we live in. Also, I mean, from my perspective, if people are involved in it, they feel proud of it. If it's done to them, then it's kind of a, a step aside. But Let somebody else do it. Yeah. Great. And but actually, I, I, think, take I, I know from conversations with the town council before that that's been a sense of uh, kind of, oh, well, people always come to us and expect us to do it. I know at Torridge, that's something that we hear have we in the past maybe kind of stopped people from coming forward? It's not something I know. Councillor Jones, thank you for putting your hand up. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with a lot of what's been said. Um, I wonder whether it would be worth speaking to the secondary school um, about these sort of projects and, and getting it out there through them. I mean, I remember having a conversation with the uh, um, new, uh, I think his title's the headmaster of the school, and it sounded like they wanted to get involved with these sort of things um, back along. So yeah. if we're trying to get this community idea going, the, the school is one of the biggest hubs and well, the biggest probably gathering of people we have in the town. So it might be worth getting in contact with them and seeing what, what they think about it, because it's by getting the school involved, you get the younger people involved, but then their parents, et cetera, like you said, with the, with the brownies. So it can sort of grow outwards from there, perhaps. I think that's an absolutely superb point. Um, it might be slightly difficult at the current seconds because I know that um, school risk assessments are the things of nightmares. Um, but actually, if we want our next generation to be coming through and be proud of their town and to filter in to kind of driving the town forward, then it was one of the things I mentioned at the start. To what extent are we providing and meeting the needs of that younger community? Um, but yeah, really it's interesting. Thank you. Just as we sort of move on from this, um, it's, it's actually, Stephen, we'll ask you in a second, but can I just ask um, whether anyone can answer this question? Do you think that Holsworthy is on the up or is going down? Do you think that it's entering 
a decline over, over years or do you think that it's getting better and better? So while you think about that, uh, Stephen, what were you going to say? Um, I was just going to go back to the whole idea of potentially um, what was wrapped up very neatly and tidily is basically pedestrianising the town square um, a few conversations back. Um, but on the whole economic growth of Holsworthy, I, I can't speak for every shop, but um, over the last 12 months, I've seen uh, I've seen a massive rise in turnover. But I think that is uh, one of two things, uh, mostly a change of my business model um, to adapt to the new economic climate and then having to readapt again because of COVID. Um, but um, back to the pedestrianising the town, um, I think that would be a mistake. I think that would be a huge mistake. There are a lot of shops in the town such as Woolacott's, such as me, I'm sure Pete as well, we've got elderly customers lifting heavy things in and out of cars. You've got Woolacott's with customers with fridges, TVs. you got me with customers with their PCs and stuff. Uh, I'm sure Pete sells heavy equipment in his shop. And that's, you know, I'm just thinking of three shops, for example. Um, you've got the charity shops, which rely on um, van loads and deliveries and things. I think potentially pedestrianising the square would be um, would cause a lot of problems. How would you feel about um, a sort of timed closure? So, for instance, at the moment, it doesn't feel as though there's in, maybe enough going on in the town square in the evening. What if that was closed for, for that sort so, of, thing of the day? So outside. So on on that with closing in the evenings i don't think there's much you could do to holdsworthy in the evenings in terms of bringing people into the square because it, we haven't got the right businesses in the square that would be open in the evenings um other than takeaway shops um but there's a catch-22 with that because um people want to park outside the takeaway shops which i've got on the list of things as one of my bugbears with the square at the moment is in the evenings after five o'clock peak times people park by co-op and block the square's entrance which um, can be eased with the HSBC road being open and people being able to pass straight through but that's another kettle of fish that will probably come to later but um, I don't know I don't I'm not um, closed-minded on that but I think whatever happens I think whilst the main shops in the square are trading there needs to be access to the public and I used, you mentioned Holsworthy has a car park right next to the square that's all well and good but um, a mo majority of my customers are elderly and I can't expect Doris to lug her you know her 10 kilo PC from the car park into the shop and I'm in the shop on my own so I can't shut the shop and lock the door and go collect it from her um, but it's not just my business that will be impacted by that there are other businesses in the square like Pete's or Willicott's that will also be impacted by that Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I, I understand that this thing has come up time and again and been rejected time and again. So it's not something that I want to particularly push. I suppose the question is, you know, I and mean, there, are, there are two things really. One, what is the evidence that it would even improve things? Um, and I think, you know, that every, as I say, every place is unique. So it's not though I can give you incontrovertible evidence that it would improve, it would improve things. I have seen places that I feel are relatively similar, which are sort of which are quite a reliance on the car, a, a sort of, um, are, are, you know, essentially rural communities. Um, and I have seen them turn things around uh, by making their town squares pedestrianised. And you absolutely take your point about older people. But um, it, as I say, if every place is different, it might be that it doesn't work. For you and, and this is your plan. So, you know, I won't. I'm, can I can I add then, if um, if we want to make less reliance on vehicles, perhaps um, how's um, how's Doris going to get from Bradworthy into um, into the town square to bring her laptop in so I can fix it for her? There's uh, no regular bus service from Bradworthy to Holsworthy. Yeah, so that's a really really good point, and I think we've got somebody on the call that that is is doing a, a project on community transport. Is that correct? But that was tried. Um, I, I know it was tried on a very local scale in Holsworthy, where um, uh, I think it was the transport shop that was in the square. I don't know where they are now, but um, out of their own pockets, they tried a little minibus project to shuttle old people around who have mobility issues to bring them into the square. And the service, from what I gather, it was um, withdrawn because of lack of use. 
mm. because um, it's there's a whole there's a whole cultural diff you know there's a whole cultural barrier there. You know, people with cars they want to use their cars because it's their independence. You know, yeah. they, these plans work in cities and different towns, but I think Holesworthy is unique as you keep on mentioning. Um, you need to have a unique outlook on it, and sometimes a unique outlook may be keeping some things in place, whereas other towns move on and adapt and change. Um, those particular changes might not apply to Holesworthy. You've got a lot of farmers, um, you know, a lot of independent people who live remotely and have no choice but to use their vehicles. You know, it's Stephen, I think you, you've picked up a couple of really interesting points there, and I think what we're not in any way saying is let's completely shut the square off. Um, I don't know if that's something that any of us want to do. Um, I think Ben's point about partial kind of possessionization was more focused, for example, on a uh, Saturday sort of late afternoon, early evening kind of uh, in a similar way to a lot of people enjoy um, Peter's Fair Week because actually yeah, so uh, it, it's shut off. But I'm, I'm aware also so that we've had Pete and Vanessa kind of waiting very patiently. I, I think. And Julia too. Yeah. Okay, well, we've looped around a couple of times there. So I'm going to Pete, then Vanessa, then Julia. Okay. Okay. Actually, I'm going to carry on the same point as Stephen, to be honest. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, it. I think going back to economically, the town, I think the town is on the up, to be fair. As okay. you said before, there's only one, em well, two maybe empty units, really. Um, all the other shops are taken. Um, if it, um, the two shops that are empty, are owned by Matthew Newt. One's being redeveloped and one's trying to find a, a tenant. Um, so I, th I think I think Hosea is only up. I think a, th a few years ago it was going down. I think things are, are, are picking up. And I think that's shown through this lockdown period, to be honest, um, because most, well, I think actually all the traders I've spoken to have actually done okay, really. I mean, it's crazy to say that all these big chains are closing and losing jobs left, right and centre, but Holsworthy is very independent and um, the independents are actually doing very well. Um, going back to pedestrianisation of the square, I again feel it's a bad, uh, a bad option really. Um, there was talk about closing it in the evenings. Actually, in the evenings, come half past six, seven o'clock, the town is rammed with cars, absolute fool. I don't know where people are, whether that's the whether that's people who live in town are parking their cars there, but I mean, um, co-op always seems busy in the evening. Um, the takeaway shops busy in the evening. Um, pubs generally are, are fairly busy. Um, holsbury has got a massive catchment area, and people want to drive. People want to drive into town. So uh, again, what Steve said about the lack of buses, um, you know it is what it is but people want their independence people want to drive people want to drive to shops to pick up whatever they want and then and then go and that was highlighted again in lockdown with the the use of barrels restricting parking a lot of people came to me said that um because of the the lack of parking they would go elsewhere they'd go to whatever uh, bnms and Bude or whatever you know or waitrose and, and, and use that um uh what other notes have i got here you said about St. Peter's Fair and you know, closing the square off on Saturday afternoons for that sort of atmosphere. You find there is quite, a, how do I say it? There, there can be some unruly behaviour on St. Peter's Fair. I know a few windows have been smashed in the past. And if you pedestrianise the square, you're just, you're going to get a lot of young people gathering in the square. And that is a recipe for disaster, in my opinion. Okay, right. I'm going to switch over to Vanessa and then Julia, and then I believe Councillor Jones as well. Hi. Um, I'm going to mention pedestrian one last time, and that's it. That's no, fine. <laughs> the 2003 study only suggested a part, they did say a part pedestrianisation, mm. which was the top half of the square up to the pump, and it still had the opening from up to Victoria Square. So just to confirm that, so nobody said the full square, there was still some parking in there. But I think, I mean, I don't, I don't live in the town, but I've been associated with the town for a long, long time, as a lot of you would know. I think it's on the up or leveled out. I mean, it's difficult because coronavirus, we haven't got any many empty shops. Um, and I think we've got a real opportunity because we've got, the, count, the town has accepted quite a lot of new housing into the area. 
um, which is great because it will allow it to drive. I know some people say, oh, they're, all new, they're new to the area, but there's a lot of people there that want to move to the town because they love it, because they can see it's got a viable, it's a viable town. It's got lots of things they want. Graham knows, Graham will know. Um, but also it's got this potential. We just need to make sure they come into town. That's what I think anyway. Mm -hmm. Vanessa, can I just ask, are there any sort of efforts to communicate with the people, the sort of new people? And if so, what, what, what is the sort of dialogue between them? And Sorry, I, I missed that bit, Ben, you're a bit quiet. What's the, what's the sort of dialogue between the town and those new people? Is there, is there sort of ways for them to easily get involved? Do they, what, 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 what do you that do? That might be the best one to speak because he's, he's moved into the town. We have recently, only recently done an A5, A5 five flies suggesting people shop locally come into town use your local market and things like that um i think there are some gaps in the offer for the town There's some shops we know children's clothes clothes generally shoes um but i think there's still some issues we've got i think we've got another 200 houses coming in to the area over the next few years and that's 200 houses where we need to get them into the town um i don't know whether it's because they won't I don't know really I just think that there's some opportunity there and we are, we must think about how we get them into town and what the offer is they're missing so it could well be we do some sort of I don't know survey to see what people want see what we can do I don't know it might be a that, suggestion that would be a really interesting thing a really interesting idea yeah um Councillor yeah, Jones got oh. that's the other thing where do we find the shops as Joe quite already said we haven't got and also, it's not just the square, it's the whole town. Of yeah. course. You know, the other, sh the other businesses around the square as well. Yeah. So it's not just the square we're talking about, it is the, the town as a whole, I would Absolutely. say. Absolutely. It's, it's, for me, it's how the town centre provides for the community. Um, and the town centre is not just the square, it is all the kind of surrounds and how it, we all make the most of all of that. So, um, Councillor Jones, thank you for waiting. Oh, sorry, uh, apologies. Julia, I almost skipped over you. Sorry for... Um, so oh, Julia, you're very, very quiet. That's not usually something I'm accused of. <laughs> very rare. I'll stand a bit closer. Is that any better? Yeah, that's better. Thank yeah. you. Okay, I was perhaps just a bit far away. Um, so, yeah, Holsworthy Rural Community Transport um, trialled a town shuttle in Holsworthy. Um, it lasted about three months, I believe, was the trial. And this was a sort of circular route. It was going, I think, every hour over seven hours over the day. So the route was you know, circled seven times a day and it was going to take people all the way around. So you could um, come into the town centre, um, out to the doctor's surgery, down to Waitrose. I think it actually went out to the market site as well and um you know beforehand all the uh, research suggested this was going to be extremely popular and people would like it it wasn't the case people did not use it um i'm just off the top of my head um the, the figures were something like the the amount of passengers that we needed um to make it viable in in a day we were getting in a week or something like that it, you know that's how badly or how poorly supported it was um and so it was stopped after the three month trial because of the costs we just couldn't bear the costs um and then of course there was a complete uproar outrage and loads of feedback about how you know we were going to use that at some point and how upset people were that we had withdrawn it and things like you know well it's holes whether you should really have run it for at least 12 months before you should have made a decision forget people used to the idea but unfortunately it wasn't financially viable to run it for 12 months at such a loss mm -hmm. so that's yeah that that was trialed and it, it was um you the, know it was not found to be popular should we say the, the crucial thing there is trialing actually giving something a go uh, and we've yeah, seen, an yeah. seen an opportunity and I think that's something that we can look into on a various different levels. Mm, mm. If we don't try things, we're never going to find things that work. Uh, Councillor Jones, apologies. No, sorry, just to, just oh, to go for jump it. Oh, So close again. 
I think one of the um, to say that it's been tried and it failed does not mean mean to say that um, it was the right trial, as it as it were. So community transport is working really well in rural areas where, for instance, it's all it's orderable. So you order it like a cab, and then an algorithm figures out the best way to get round to get people round. So um, it, just to have a sort of circular route isn't necessarily working for the sort of modern way that people I think travel. Ben, that's where kind of the, hopefully the tie up, if we get the funding essentially between Karen working with Julia, um, sort of moving forward, it, that's exactly kind of the conversation that we've uh, had to make sure that, I mean, the Holsworthy Community Transport Partnership does great work, but it's always about how do we do more? How do we meet the needs of more people? Um, also to make sort of the transport partnership more efficient and support them so it's it's definitely something that's a, a key conversation going back to what Stephen was saying, saying earlier about kind of supporting what is potentially a rurally isolated community in, in many ways um, right this time I am going to make it to Councillor Jones Stephen I'll come back to you in a minute marvellous thank you um, firstly I think the, the comment that having a load of young people coming into the town is only going to be a recipe for disaster is a little bit unfair on, uh, on unfair on us younger younger people but there we are um, I think if we actually look at Holsley as a whole I think that in terms of the town I think I think it seems to be the, the actual shops and the the center itself I'd say is probably as it was or, or maybe slightly improving but I would say if you look at Holsley more sort of holistically and you look at this sort of idea of the community of Holsley I think it's probably about the strongest and on the up and the best it's ever been. I mean, when you look at the, the effort that's come together with this, um, the COVID mutual aid group and what they managed to achieve, actually, I would say Holsley is probably, in, if, if anything, going from going from strength to strength, if you look at it in those sorts of terms. So uh, linking back to what we said earlier, now is probably the, the best time to sort of strike while the iron is hot and, and try and do these other other community-based things which um, we'd already discussed that's all I had to say. I think it's an absolutely superb point um, it was very noticeable from my perspective within Torridge how quickly and how efficiently Holsworthy kicked in um, as a community and as a strong coordinated effort and it is really about how we capitalise on that and get those people to to stay involved. Uh, Stephen I'm going to come to you, um, Councillor Hutchings has had his uh, hand up for a while, go for it John. Um... Just want to back up uh, what Julia said about the community transport. Um, the other issue with that trial was the fact that it had to be, because it was a bus route, it, had, it was a timetabled route, therefore it had to be um, stick to a timetable, but also um, it had the, um, the bus pass with it. So people with a bus pass only paid like 25 pence or something stupid like ah. that. <laughs> so that that was a major problem but they had that wasn't that wasn't the, the community transport that was they because it was a timetabled route they had to put that in force so even though the numbers may have been you know they, they weren't i wouldn't say they're horrendous they weren't particularly good but it looked a lot worse because of what they were actually physically paying um so instead of paying one pound fifty they were paying like 25 30 pence something like that so that had a massive impact on it but that was because it was a timetabled route and they had to offer that um a couple of other things um the bit about St. Peter's Fair and unruly behaviour, don't agree with that because actually there's very little. Um, and I don't. I think we had one window smashed in about the last five years, I think. Um, and um, there was something else, but I can't remember. But yeah, I, I agree with the fact of the, the, the round route maybe wasn't the right thing to do. But at the time, that was, that was what was, was offered and was a good idea. Um, but I think paying for it is always going to be an issue. And who pays for it? Yeah, always. Um, Stephen, thank you for waiting. Uh, yeah, so back to the community transport thing. Um, the other issue with people not using their own vehicles and using public transport is for the last six months, the government has scared everybody to death that they're going to uh, get coronavirus if they travel on buses. And, you know, it, particularly elderly people who are vulnerable will um, take fear to that and make note and that will stick in their heads that actually they might get flu instead or they might get, might get common cold things like that and I just I, I think there's been a whole negative impact on um, public transport usage over the last few months. I, I would agree with that one I, I do however know that my uh, mother and father-in-law were absolutely delighted to get back on the bus networks um, as they thoroughly enjoy pootling around on the bus and the freedom that it gives them um, so I think 
what I'm reluctant for us to do is to sweep in, to talk in terms of huge sweeping generalizations. Um, we're never with Holsworthy going to completely cut out the car. Um, but especially in terms of Torridge being committed to a climate emergency and also thinking about our young people and how we can support them. Um, I know, for example, people who haven't been able to get young people who haven't been able to get jobs in Holsworthy despite living in the community because they couldn't get in to work at the right time without kind of a parent driving them in. So it's making sure that we're, we're creating a, almost a blended solution that works for as many people as possible. Uh, John, you, your hand's gone back up again. Do you remember that other point? I'm oh. saying yes. Yes, I do. Um, okay. um, it was about pedestrianising the square. Um, and I put a plan several years ago, which was about a herringbone parking where you actually didn't close off the whole of the square. You, kept, you put it as a one way through the square, but that top end got closed off. Um, which, and, and I, I understand some of the points that, um, like Steve made earlier on about shops, you know, and how do they get, you know, people without being able to park outside the shop. Um, but actually, once two cars are parked outside the shop, you can't get to it anyway. So they've got to park further away. Um, but I think some sort of pedestrianising would be a good step forward. Although I think it would be very controversial looking at something like, you know, a trial where part of it is closed off might be a way ahead which would keep everyone happy because you have the, the closed bit, which makes it a, a viable space to do different things in the town. Yeah. Um, the uh, other is, you talk about Saturday afternoon. If you walk around Hosey on Saturday, it's dead on a Saturday afternoon because a lot of the shops close at midday, one o'clock on a Saturday. Um, and that, you know, without getting the, all the traders behind it, I know Steve tried opening it later on a Saturday at some points, and, but you've got to get the whole town behind, you know, opening late it's like a thursday opening isn't it you know if you go to plymouth they open late on a thursday night um i know we tried to persuade shopkeepers to do that in holsley but nobody a lot of the shops don't seem to be up for that kind of challenge again i think um, Stephen mentioned catch 22 earlier on um and the facts that how do you persuade people to open when there's not a footfall and how do you persuade the footfall when there's no one open um Stephen. Uh, I've, for the last 12 months, I've been open till four on a Saturday. I've um, decided to put my money where my mouth was last year and um, doing four days Saturdays every so often. Uh, although I haven't done it for the last six months because of COVID. I uh, blame everything on COVID like everybody does. But um, I was promoting the free parking in the car park after one o'clock, things like that, trying to encourage people that actually Holsworthy is still open on Saturday afternoon. But reality is uh not everybody has joined on that bandwagon and until everybody joins in with that it's um it feels like it's uh you know i'm wasting time but yeah. i get a lot of things done so <laughs> um Steven, can i just ask you um a couple of questions what what's your business what do you run uh, i've got the computer shop in the square Ah, perfect. Okay. And, and the second thing is, do you, do, so the uh, car parking is free on Saturday afternoons, is it? Do you see that as having had much of an effect in terms of footfall on Saturday afternoons in Hosworthy? Not at all. Okay. Um, I think it's a positive idea and I like the idea and I back it. You know, it, it's, it's a good way of trying to get people in on Saturday afternoons, but um, I think people have got it so stuck in their head that Hosworthy is closed on Saturday afternoon. Um, but they just avoid the town and um, unfortunately, um, you know, it's the traders on that one that have um, have to take the blame. People who have decided that that's going to be the rule for so long have made that the rule. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's right. just convention, isn't it? And do you think that do you think that if the two hours was sort of a different time that it would be good for Holsworthy? What, the uh, free parking? Yeah. Um, in, in what sense? Uh, like moving it forward into the afternoon or moving it back to the morning? Well, whenever. So do, you, um, do you think two hours free parking on a, a different time would, would be better for Holsworthy if, if it was forward or back? Or I don't. I, I think um, uh, on a positive note for once, actually, I think the afternoon free parking in Memorial Hall car park is probably at the perfect time because it's at the time where the town's the quietest and you're trying to draw people into the town with free parking. Um, so I think that's one thing you guys have got right there is trying to bring people into the town with that. So I, I don't, I can't think of a better time because if you do it in the morning, people are already coming in the morning. So you're not encouraging change. You're not encouraging people to spread their 
shopping habits throughout the day. So I think I think that is as good as it can get. So to go back to that sort of chicken and egg issue, um, if there are certain incentives to get people in, then what else can the town provide? So I'm thinking maybe the market or, or something. Are we, are we talking specifically on a Saturday? Yes. So um, I, I don't, it, it's difficult because I've got so many viewpoints on the whole pedestrianisation of the square. Um, there are so many different angles on it. Um, most of my personal angles on it are negative, but um, I think if um, I think if some places there were more seating areas and there were more uh, food type businesses, restaurants with outdoor seating areas on a Saturday afternoon, um, maybe well, I don't think KJ's would be the right sort of business to do that. But um, you know, if there were more eateries that were open on a Saturday afternoon in the square. Um, with outdoor seating, that would have a positive impact, but we don't have those sort of businesses in the square, therefore um, that doesn't work. Um, so it's a well, difficult the, Maybe the market could, could, in, could encourage some street food traders and like that. I, again, I um, wholeheartedly support the market opening on a Saturday, um, other than a Wednesday, because most people with working habits are at work on a Wednesday. Um, I know that's not a popular opinion. Um, hopefully, I don't get lynched out of the town for that one. Um, but, uh, but again, but if we don't talk about it, nothing happens. Yeah. Sorry? That's why you're sat in at the moment. <laughs> yeah. With a fast getaway planned as well. Um, right, I'm, I'm, I'm aware that... Um, Pete's arm is probably about to fall off because he has been waving it at me for quite a long time. Go for it, Pete. <laughs> Pete, you're on mute again. Sorry, I've got That's five right. points. I'll make them even quicker. Let's go for um, it. The first point, has the free parking been confirmed by TDC? Uh, I, I'm going to delegate that response to councillors Hutchings and Jones. So that was, that was why I raised my hand was just to confirm that, that the two hours free parking has just been going to scrutiny, but it will go to from the next full council. Um, and that is uh, two hours. The proposal is for two hours free parking at any time. Ah. Okay, there's a bit of confusion there because I was talking about <laughs> the afternoon period on Saturday in which past one o'clock you get complete free parking for the rest of the day. Which yeah. is the other point I was going to make about that is the fact that I don't think the town promote that enough because most people would not know that there's two hours free, well, that it's free on a, from Saturday until Monday morning. It's free. Um, yeah, I agree with that. Promoted more. Yeah, okay. Um, Se Pete, second, point, second point quickly. Um, the market getting shifted to a Saturday, great idea, I think. Um, I think it would help people's buying habits, people who work during the week, people of, don't tend to work on the Saturday. Um, so shifting to a Saturday, great. That leads on to my next point, which is um, I, I open till four on a Saturday, like Steve. Now I can see why a lot of shops don't. A lot of shops, they're self-employed, they're one-man bands, and they work from at least nine to five, Monday to Friday. And I can see why they want to do half a day Saturday. I, I can see it, you know, people have got children, people have got other plans. I can see why they do that, you see. So it's all very well, you know, Poo poo and the traders saying you should be open. Well, some have got lives, they, they can't do it. Okay. Um, third point is the part ped pedestrianization of the square. It will remove a lot of the free parking, in fact, most of it, because it would be all the center of the square and around the outside from Steve's shop all the way up to um, the uh, Odette's shop, the uh, Sugar mm -hmm. and Ice. I think, uh, Pete, my one point on that one is, uh, um, and it's a point that I'm going to keep coming back to, I think this is a key point that, going back to Vanessa's town survey, that we need to make sure it is central to that, to actually understand, actually, what do a lot of people think about this? Uh, mm -hmm. Would it be attracting more people if actually it felt safer? Um, Vanessa, don't worry, I'm not going to dump this one completely on your shoulders. I'm going to dump it largely on Adrian and Hamish to work with you on. And, and my, my last point, and I'll be quiet, is um, uh, Councillor Hutchins said about a trial period of um, park closing the square. Well, we, we do that every year. On St. Peter's Fair Week, we do shut half of the square off. And if you ask any trader, 
they will say that St. Peter's Fair Week is their worst for turnover. Now, I know I keep going on about the traders, the traders, the traders. The thing is, if there's no shops in Holsworthy, you know, the town will die. So we've got to make sure the shops thrive and then everything comes from that. It's, it's, Pete, it's a really important blend. Um, making sure that we've got, that we're serving the community and that the traders are thriving and that it's that kind of happy little sweet point where yeah. we make sure, whoa, there's the super lady again flying in. Um, sorry, uh, that everyone is is really working kind of together on it. Uh, super lady kind of mayor heaven who keeps Councilor flying Shepherd, in. Sorry, can I just ask, oh. do you, what else would you say would make the town thrive? So, you're, you know, you're, is it just parking issues? Or do you think, what else is economically, do you think the town needs? Well, it's things that are out of the, our control, really. I think lack of diverse shops is a big one. But what, what can you do? You know, I know Torridge own a couple of buildings in the square. Whether, whether they can do reduced rents for businesses that aren't in the square already, I don't know. It's, the, really? it's, it's a big question, and I, I don't think I can answer it, to be honest. All right, that's fine. Sorry to put you on the spot. Sorry, Chris, carry on. That's all right, Councillor. Uh, uh, the mayor keeps flying in. Sorry. Just to say, that going on about St Peter's Fair and everything, but it's tradition, and Holsley has got to keep their traditions. Yeah. No, I, 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 I think... The traders it's a case of well you have to just take that one because it is tradition it's like everything we need to keep those traditions yeah, I, I completely agree mm -hmm. I, was, I was just i was just highlighting the point of if you um part shot the square how that will affect the traders but i i completely agree i believe in keeping st peter's fair keep, keeping the market i completely agree mm -hmm. I, yes I do. it's whether for me whether we could utilize uh say if in, even if it was every once a month, for example, on a Saturday, and then how do we organize some kind of event collectively um, around that once monthly? So is it a case of, could we persuade the plow to be putting on something? Could we um, be, going back to what Ben was saying about uh, speaking to uh, street food um, vans to come in? And there's a really interesting kind of uh, event that used to take place before um, the pandemic called Electric Lights down in Tiverton um, that was just a group of street food vans who came in and then they started getting bands involved as well. And all of a sudden you've got a night out. Um, so I think it's having a conversation and going back to, again, what would entice the, the community to come in. John, thank you for waiting. Um, so we're all talking about change and we have to change but actually do we have to change because we, i've said this all along about holsley biddeford and torridge and holsley is very unique very different the truth of it is that what we've got in holsley at the moment and i think a lot of it is probably due to covid and the results of covid but what we have in holsley at the moment seems to be working we have very few empty shops the shopkeepers are saying they're doing okay um i've got a pub i'm doing okay um actually is there anything we need to physically change is it just the fact of promoting what we already have to try and make it more but actually i know we say we, there's a need for change but is there a need for change you know do we keep what we've got but try and just promote more one thing we've never really done in holding we've looked at ways over the past you know we looked at things on buses and things like that um, but is to pr promote the fact that we are a small market town, a very unique place. Um, that I was looking out the door this morning. There's loads of tourists about this today. You know, they're still around. They're still coming into town. They're walking around the town. Um, that's a good thing. So do we actually have to change anything? Do we just look at what we've got and think, right, well, you know, rather than, rather than take that away, let's leave it um, and just promote it um my other thing going back to the square um has anyone ever thought about the fact that car parking also has a negative impact on the square because when people get used to parking in the square when they drive there and there are no spaces they drive out and they carry on even though the car park the main car park might be half empty they actually drive in drive around the square and then drive off again and that's some that has a negative impact for us i see julian um, nodding away there the market, 
Wednesday is my worst day of trading in Holsley. However, I'm a firm believer that the market must stay in Holsley because it's our only USP that we have. Um, we need to keep that market. It's doing well at the moment. It's getting bigger. Um, hopefully that will carry on once again. I think that's a result of COVID because as there are less places to trade. Um, trading on a Saturday for the market, well, I don't think that's viable. That, well, not viable. I don't think that will happen because the traders that we have come to Holsley on a Wednesday, this is their day. If you look at Saturday markets, there were too many Saturday markets where those traders already go. And trying to get them to come to Holsworthy when we're competing with the likes of Barnstable Market is just not going to happen. And viewed on a Saturday. So I, I think that's, unless you change the kind of market we have, then I don't think that will happen. Um, but I think COVID has a lot to answer for and a lot to be for Holsworthy, quite a lot at the moment to be positive of. Because it's meant that people do actually come into the town more. They do shop local. They are using local businesses. You know, I found that people that, you know, would probably get in their car and drive 20 miles to go out for something to eat or a drink. They're actually staying more local. And I'm sure that's the case with the shops. I know pizza over lockdown, you know, very busy along with the post offices and places like that, because actually people are traveling further distances. So the car park is even more important than ever. But that square, I still, you know, there could be something to talk about that. Um, and the other thing is stop the traders parking in the square to free it up for people that actually want to come and shop. And that is a direct dig at certain people. Um, John, <laughs> a really, really important point on in, ter in terms of does, do we have to change? You absolutely do not need to change if you don't, you know, if, if it's not necessary. So the question here, is there anything that needs to change for the town to thrive? If the place continues to thrive, then there is no need for change. But I guess there are two points to make here. The first is change is happening anyway, and it continues, you know, across the country, retail is changing, the patterns of retail are changing. Um, most places, uh, uh, in most places, retail is contracting and it's being replaced by other things. And that will happen eventually in all places. So, you know, change is happening anyway. And then I guess the second point is, you have to be really, really sure that you're speaking for everyone when you say that nothing needs to change, because there are, you know, it, you have to consider that broader economic issues around are there enough jobs for young people? You know, is there, uh, you know, is, 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 is everyone being served by the status quo, essentially? And so uh, I guess I guess those questions are questions that, that you as a town need to ask yourself as you think about what the vision needs to be going forward. Yes, you don't have to change, but, you know, these are important questions. Um, to um, quickly, come, quickly come to Nigel, who I believe um, probably wanted to support a sense of uh, selling the town better. Uh, uh, yeah, like John was saying about promoting the town, we haven't got a dedicated group or committee that actually their only focus is promoting the town. I said that to Ben the other day, that I think that's one thing we could think about is having a dedicated group that the sole focus is promoting the town, not just the town square, all of the town. Yeah, it's really interesting you say that. Um, uh, I think Torrington Town Council have got their first uh, marketing group meeting at the end of this month. Um, Biddeford Town Council has just started their own marketing group. Um, so it's initially... I mean, kind this of... could be a council-led initiative, sure, but it needs to involve... It can't just be a council thing. That's exactly what I was about to say as well. That kind yeah. of the, the really pleasing thing for me is that both of those projects um, have gone, right, well, we've got to call a few people from the council, but in the nicest way, if it's just from a council, no one's going to listen. Um, it yeah. needs to come from kind of a broader spectrum of people. Now, I'm aware as well, uh, and I'm not going to apply any pressure on people, I'm aware that it's 10 to 8 that we've, this conversation has flown past. Thank you so much. Um, but unusually, Graham's been very quiet. Uh, Pam, has, uh, Pam, Sue and Joe have all sat there uh, very quietly, as has Bridget. Would any of you kind of um, like to sort of contribute at all? I'm not going to force you to, um, but have you got any responses to any of the things that have been picked up? Pam, you look like you've leant forward. There we go. Yeah, okay. I was just going to unmute myself. Um, well, my um, drum to bang is uh, the cycleway down to Bude. Um, I was at um, on the Camel Trail um, just a couple of weekends ago, um, and you only got to see what that's done for Way Bridge, um, and it 
it would definitely enhance um, economic regeneration for Hosworthy if the cycleway was ever able to be opened up down to Bude. Yeah. Um, because if, if the weather's not great for a day on the beach, um, it's very doable to bimble up to Hosworthy, eight and a half, nine miles, and bimble back. Um, whereas the route the other way to sort of Bitterford and Barnstable, it's it's a much longer schlep. So, um, I think if you look at how busy it is between, um, say, Torrington and Bitterford, or Bitterford and Instow along the Tarka Trail, and you can see on those, as you say, reasonable days. I know that I do with my family go up and down. Um, I, I spoke to Councillor Hutchings about this one this morning. Um, Adrian is getting involved in a lot of cycling infrastructure. It is a complicated one, though, given the, given the nature of ownership on that one. Yep. But um, Adrian's going to get briefed on it in the very near future because we need to make sure that we have our eyes open for where an opportunity could come with on that one. So, and I mean, Bude is, is the next place to be developed up that coast, um, yep. you know, Padstow, um, Rock, um, Port Isaac, all those areas are sort of getting saturated and mm. um, it's moving further north and, um, you know, it's, no, I, it's a no brainer in my mind. If, if we could ever make it happen, I think we'd all be delighted. Um, Joe, you le leant forward a second ago and smiled as if you kind of wanted to get involved. Don't feel I'm forcing you in any way. Um, I wasn't going to weigh in on the on the bike thing, but I think um, the Pete's kind of right about a variety of shops would help, but it's very difficult to achieve. You just kind of have to wait for the opportunity, really. Um, but I do think that the absence of ladies' clothes shouldn't wholly be underplayed because that was the reason for some people to come into town. The factory shop might have had its flaws, but it was very good for pretty much anything you wanted. And that did encourage people into town more probably than bargain buys does. Um, and also I think coming back to our favorite point of pedestrianization, look at what happened to Launceston. I don't think you want to go there. There's, it's all very well part pedestrianising it or pedestrianising it and saying, well, we're going to have good events now. But unless you have a firm programme of events with uptake, it's pointless because people will just never come into town again. Yeah, I, I think that's a fantastic point in terms of having a committed programme uh, and getting those partners on board for that regular programming to make sure that people actually know what's going to happen and when, because otherwise it very quickly becomes, oh, well, I haven't got time to organise something this month. And then it just dies. Um, really good point. Um, da, 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 da. Uh, Graham, Sue, Bridget and Mary, any kind of desire to contribute? Honestly, not feel for Bridget. Yeah, I just want to, not everybody knows me, but I'm a um, community developer employed by TTVS under the One Northern Devon umbrella. Um, if there's anything you were talking earlier about the gardening and things like that and getting the community groups involved, um, I'm happy to use some of my time to help sort of coordinate anything like that. Anything that's got a health and well-being slant to it. I'm more than happy to sort of, you know, help with the coordination of that if it's appropriate. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Bridget. I think uh, that would be really appreciated. Um, okay. Ben, I'm also aware that kind of uh, a lot of the input that you wanted to, to add has gone completely out the window, but I think it's been a fascinating discussion. Very much so. No, it's, it's about it's about their input that, rather than my input. Um, so it's been really useful. Thank you. Uh, right, John, is that hand back up again? Um, I just want to throw something in the mix about the square. Um, for not last year, but several years before that, Devon County Council wanted to bring in um, pay meters for the square. We fought against it, and I can see that coming back very soon. Um, that's something we're going to need to to look at. Um, and, and work out, but I think that's Devon County Council are going to be trying to get every penny they possibly can. I think that's going to come back and rear its head very, very soon, and just something for people to be aware of. I think. Yeah, and I think the the issue connected to that as well is that the um, our contact who's been working with us off and on, as in James Anstey at Devon Highways, is no longer in that role, so we no longer have a contact point. Um, especially one who knows about these ongoing discussions. Um, I think that's a very, 
astute point, unfortunately. Um, right, I think it's now about three minutes to eight. So has anyone got any final last points that they would desperately like to raise? Um, in which case, I'm going to hand over to Ben, um, basically, to make sure that you've all got his contact details uh, and can pester him from now on. This is all the content you missed. Imagine, poor, poor you. Right, so let me just bring this up. Uh, I hope you can see that. So, so yeah. So it's basically another two or three weeks that I've got to write this action plan. It's it's not a massive report that gathers dust on the shelf. It's uh, it's going to be quick and dirty. Reading back quite a lot of the things that you said to me, as I, as as I've mentioned, you know, I want it to be. It's challenging, but I don't want it to be something that is never going to get delivered. Um, and so if you've got any specific points that you'd like to make that you don't feel like you've got across, if you think there's other people that I need to speak to that I haven't yet spoken to, um, and if you feel like there's a sort of voice that hasn't been put yet, um, you know, the voice of, of any specific kinds of residents or, or anyone else that, or, or young people that I haven't managed to speak to yet, um, I'd really be grateful to hear that sort of diversity of opinion and so put them in touch with me if you can um, and then basically once I've written this uh, uh, action plan uh, it, it will have a sort of month to consult on it um, and you can you can uh, debate it among yourselves and figure out which bits you want to keep and which bits you want to get rid of mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but apart from that um, that's it for this evening I think so I'm really grateful uh, for your time thank you Ben, thank you so much. I think from my perspective, and um, that's been a really interesting discussion, I think my goal is from this is that when Ben sort of collates these opinions into a sense of action plan, that's something that we can utilise, for example, for uh, a survey to kind of actually bring more opinions in and looping back round to my very first point, try and see if we can get a, a stronger sense of what is the desire of the community Going back to John's point, where do we want change? Where do actually we don't want change at all? Um, and try and create that sense of a vision for us all to move towards during the next couple of years. Um, guys, thank you so, so much for giving up your Wednesday evening. It really is appreciated, especially as I know that a lot of you do a huge amount for the town um, already uh, and are very busy individuals. Thank you so much. And I look forward to uh, catching up with you all again soon.